Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. Have you considered the amount of grace that has been bestowed on us? Have you ever considered every morning to wake up and think about the total amount of grace that has been poured out on us? I think it's a little overwhelming if you begin to truly perceive and take in the amount of grace that God has poured on us. The scripture this morning is not a treatise on who God is or who Christ is. It is what God has done for us and the love that has been bestowed. As some of you know, I'm on the board of ordained ministry, so if you're going to be ordained in the Texas Annual Conference, I'm one of the people you get to interview with. And in that process, we also send, it's about a seven-year process, after you graduate from seminary to be fully ordained in the Methodist Church. There is a long vetting process. And in it, there's, a, there's three psychological examinations. You take one before you start. You take one uh, midway through and you take one right before they ordain you. They shortened it just to two, uh, uh, but that's kind of details at this point. And they have three classifications uh, because as clergy, we're simple. We only need three. One is they give you a one. They're good to go. I want you all to know right now, I got a one on all three of them. Because <laughs> I know somebody's going to be inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> then there is a two, which means... They're probably going to be just fine, but they need a little work, and they give you some things to work on. So a one, a two, okay, but needs work. And then there's a three, which is in no way ordain this person ever to ministry. They will harm themselves or harm other people. <laughs> Jim Jones. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, now it comes, yeah, okay, now I got it, right? So anyway, in that process, uh, if you've never had a psychological exam, I advise one. They're real fun. <laughs> and so one of my friends, we were doing ministry together, and we were talking, and I've talked to many people about their experience that have gone through this, and he wanted me to know something about himself and in the way his psychologicals came back. And it was interesting because he was diagnosed as being excessively happy. He was excessively happy. Now, it, what was interesting is, is I don't think the psychologist thought this was good. <laughs> and there were two reasons they thought there might be a problem. One is that he was putting it on in front of them. He was making it up and he was trying to pull the wool over their eyes. And so he's excessively happy. We don't know who he really is. So we want to just give that disclosure. Or the other, which was even more disturbing to them, is he may actually be this happy to which we have no explanation for. But think about that for a moment. If, if we know Christ and, and we take ownership of what the scripture says this morning, excessive happiness, is it excessive? I mean, should we not wake up every day and understand the blessings that we have and walk around with a smile that can't be wiped off our face? I think all too often we let circumstances or people or all sorts of things steal our joy. But not my friend. He goes through life and he's excessively happy. God bless his little heart. That's what we say in East Texas, right? I, I, I was talking to somebody this week and I said, I may ask a pointed question this week. If you know salvation, and when you came to know salvation, did anything change in your life? It's a sharp question. Did anything at all change? Did there, was there some transformation? Was there some change? Did you move from one state, and are you moving to another state? Christ tells us we are to be moving more and more into Christ's likeness. So I would suggest, unless you were already perfect before you were saved, like me, that's a joke, right? Yeah, y'all know that. I'm not perfect, even close. If we're not already perfect, if we're not already there, shouldn't there be some marks of change? Shouldn't there be some transformation? And I think the answer is yes. But I think all too often we get caught up in all the wrong stuff. So this morning, I'm going to throw some people under the bus that don't go to this church. So, uh, I'm, and, and I'll throw myself under the bus as well this morning. But there is a, a friend of mine uh, who uh, was a church member at a place I was a pastor at formerly. 
And he could find a reason to be upset about anything. I mean, this guy was upset about everything, and he was upset all the time. Anybody know any? Don't name, no, no names. And, and, and here was the funny part. I don't know that there was any reason. Uh, he had his house, was completely paid for, and it was a beautiful home. His wife was a wonderful and sweet person. And in fact, he owned more than one home. He owned multiple houses. He owned quite a bit of land. He had inherited quite a bit of money. He had had successful businesses. And every time I bumped into him, he found something to be upset about. He was, up, I, I would say if you wanted to do a cycle, he was excessively unhappy. It, folks, and this was a Christian. <coughs> excessively unhappy, going through life all the way through that all the time. He, he, he occasionally asked me for pastoral advice. I told him to quit watching the news. <laughs> it's, you, amen, yeah, yeah. And you might drink a little less wine. Do you remember being a child and you would put a funny look on your face? Did your mom ever say, if you do that all the time, it's going to stick? <laughs> I want to let you know, folks. The habits we live with every day are going to stick. If we go through life being in this type of mood all the time, it's going to get sticky and it's going to stay stuck. And I hate to say this, when he would come around me and do this, I'd load up on the train. Folks, don't, don't, don't be deceived. Bad company will influence you. And we will load up and we will act that way. And I would load up on the train going to Unhappyville every day. It was something I had to fight. Now, I, I want to bring up the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, and Carol Means will be okay. He's not here today, but I'm going to go ahead and throw Carol Means under the bus. I have never met anybody other than my friend who is excessively happy as joyful as Carol Means. Anybody? Amen. Amen. Thank you. So... Carol, every time I ran into me, he was excited. He was happy. And, and I told him one day, I said, Carol, I appreciate your enthusiasm. I appreciate that you're always in a positive mood. I, I appreciate what you do for Christ. I want you to know I appreciate all that. And he stopped and he gave me one of the most serious looks I've ever seen out of Carol. And, and Carol looked at me and he said, I try. I try. Now, in that, here's what I heard, and here's an important thing that we all need to grab a hold of and we all need to understand. If you want to live a life that is different, if you want to live a life with a good attitude, if you want to be one of the people who are more Christ like, I think you need to know number one, you need to make a decision to do it. Because that's what I heard in Carol. This was a conscious decision. I try. Now, I don't know if we can all be as happy as Carol, but I know we can be happier than this other guy. <laughs> right? We can, we can make some progress. I think it is in this conscious decision every day as we go through life, we just need to make that decision that we are not going to be determined by all of this other stuff. And number two, once you make that decision, understand that God has already giving you everything you need. That, that was in our scripture today. I think that's something that we miss all the time. We wake up each day so blessed, so gifted, with so much grace that we take it for granted. And we get up and blithely go through life and occasionally, now I want you all to know this part, I'm preaching about myself. So if your toes get stepped, do, do I usually give you the, your toes could be stepped on in this part. We blithely go through life and we're unaware of what's going on. But we have been blessed with so much. We're all too worried about what we don't have. There's a cute little film that I enjoyed uh, and still enjoy. <clears throat> I think it came out in 1990 uh, called Joe versus the Volcano. Uh, anybody seen this strange little film? It is a strange little film. I'm going to give you that right now. What it really is about, uh, one of these days I may do a Wednesday night class on movies and theology because every 
movie, every story has theology in it. This particular story is about a man who is going through life, who has let everything get to him, and then after everything gets to him, he goes journeying trying to find out what the meaning of life is. And there comes a point in time where he becomes shipwrecked and he's on top of uh, four suitcases, which is a whole other funny story, but Tom Hanks is on top of four suitcases and he is almost starved to death. He is almost without water. And then all the, all of a sudden, something becomes clear to him. And can we watch that little clip? It's not very long this morning. That's a good prayer. I, I think it's a good prayer. I forgot. I think all too life, often in life, the reason we get all upset, we get, we get all upset about the wrong stuff because we forget what's really important. Was it? Now, as y'all know, uh, this last week, uh, two weeks ago, I went to UM Army, and it was hot. We had some new people there. It was really kind of interesting. One of the ladies on Thursday, I told her on Thursday, I said, today you find out how Christian you are. You find out just how well you can put up with heat and teenagers and everything else. So as we're going through UM Army, my team, I had an exceptional group of teenagers. And we finished a porch by Wednesday afternoon. And so Thursday, we got assigned to go paint a house with another crew. And so my crew, uh, we, we went to this new place. We were painting the house white with black trim. And as we're painting, one of the young men that's on the other team had a little bit of an attitude. Have you met anybody like that? <laughs> Amen. And for some reason, he decided I was his next best buddy on Thursday. <laughs> Let that sink in for a moment. Because even I get a little, I, I tell you, I'm a great Christian as long as I'm well-fed, well-slept, and air-conditioned. <laughs> you leave me out in the heat, you don't feed me. <laughs> you can find my last nerve. Oh, there it is. <laughs> So we're out there painting, and this young man, you can tell, he's worried about all the wrong stuff. He's a, he's a freshman in high school. I've been visiting with him. And what he was really concerned about is who is the dominant person in the group. He wanted to make sure who was in charge and who was reporting to who and what was working for what. And so I'm painting on a ladder, and he's standing on a ladder next to me. I'm serious. And so I suggest to him that he could paint while I paint, it's actually possible. <laughs> so you can see how I get on Thursday. And so I'm painting away, and, and, and he stopped and he said, well, look at this. I'm no longer working for you. You're the one working for me. Do, do you hear that? To which I looked at him and said, let me, let me explain to you what's really going on. <laughs> I'm working for the lady who can't afford to paint her own house. You're not working for anybody. <laughs> he said, ouch. <laughs> Give the boy some credit. He went out, he went and he got a paintbrush and he started painting with us. You see, I think all too often we're worried about all the wrong stuff when what we really need to worry about is nothing. I was working for Jesus. He was putting all sorts of things all in the wrong place. 
We do that all the time. We wake up every day and within 10 or 15 minutes of being up, are, are you worried about all the wrong stuff? This scripture says in the end, it all comes together and it all comes together in Jesus. In the meantime, what's there to be so upset about? Well, this week we had VBS, which is really a good time. Uh, we had all of our groups together. I want to say they did a fabulous job in decorating. I think it was about Tuesday when we found out the air conditioning wasn't working in part of the wing over there. I thought it was just because we had 75 kids in a small area. And so it was warm, but our volunteers stuck with it. They had all the things they needed. They did a fabulous job. We had a great lot of kids, and they learned about Jesus. You see, I think, I think all the time we worry about having all the wrong things and doing all this stuff when what we really have is a very simple message. Uh, somebody said this to me in seminary. You know, sometimes we think we need screens and sometimes we think we need this and sometimes we think we need that. When Jesus, with 12 disciples, and nothing else went and changed the world. You see, we have already been blessed with so much. We have all that we need. Now, I'm going to ask Jeff to come up here and help me because there's a, one final story, and I have no idea how this is going to go because this is my second lesson this way. It already sounds exciting, doesn't it? So when I was in Boy Scouts... Yeah, here, we'll put this in the middle. Can you make a ring around us with the yellow rope? So what they did was, I went to a um, leadership development. This is just a no-walk zone. There we go. And so they, at Troop Leadership Development Training Camp, put a circle out like this, put a can out like this, and then put another can that was radioactive stuff. Okay, are you ready for this? And then they did something really kind of fun. They took a box of stuff and poured it out and said, without going inside the circle, there you go, <laughs> put the small can into the big can. And they had this stuff all laying there, and we were like, well, how do we do it? And at that very moment, one of the young men hopped up and said, I know how to do this, which was good because none of the rest of us did. So Jeff here, take that string and you walk backwards or forwards or whichever way you want to walk. So what he did was he took string. Oh, this is not going to do that, is it? We may just describe how this went. Oh, good, that worked. Okay, so he took string. This ought to be plenty and then folded it in half. Take that end. Walk that way. Don't look, honey, I have a knife. <laughs> My wife won't let me have a box cupper ever again after a certain emergency room incident. So don't look again, honey. Oh, good, it went well. Okay. And so he then took that, and he took a group of rubber bands. I know this is fascinating at this point. And he tied them. Somebody already figured it out out there. Carlos, Carlos, you're a Boy Scout, aren't you? Well, I know how you figured it out. Okay, there's one. Do you want to invite your, your boys up? Because we can't do this with two people. Hey, look, they're coming. This is how you know who's awake. Okay, you guys walk one, 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 one way and one the other way. Just take an end of a string. And you take an end of a string. The last two are for you and I, Jeff, and we're going to see how this goes. And then we'll have ice cream. 
We should have some kind of like musician music while I do this, right? <laughs> Jeopardy music. We could do Jeopardy music. All right, I think we now have the device made. So, okay, everybody gets a string, and then we walk around on each side, and each of you kind of, here, let me swap with you, Jeff. There you go. All right, now kind of walk apart and stretch the rubber bands. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna open this set of rubber bands up. It's gotta go your way, guys. And you're gonna stretch the rubber band and put it over the small can. So you guys pull. Keep pulling. <laughs> it's gotta go your way. Keep pulling. Keep pulling, here we go. All right, guys, it's gotta come my way now. Do you see the small can? Okay, we're trying to wrap those rubber bands around the small can. Keep coming. West, go that way a little bit. There you go, Wes. There's a reason you're, you're, you should be at a 45 there, buddy. Okay, now we just... Wes. There you go. Now let it loose. Now we just put it in the other can. Just let go. All right. You guys are brave. Thank you for doing that. There'll be a check in the mail. <laughs> you know, in life, they give you all sorts of extra things that I'm not sure what we would ever use. I think they put those in there just to see if you're paying attention. But what I want you to know is we already have everything we need to do the mission of what Christ has called us to do. We have forgiveness, we have grace, and we know the end of the story. And the end of the story is it all comes together in Jesus. My prayer for you is may you wake up each day living fully into the grace that God has for you, and may somebody call you excessively happy because <laughs> the world doesn't understand. But I sure hope they want it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.